So, we're kicking off the second half with a panel discussion, just starting where we just left off, and it's regarding the topic Artificial Intelligence Integrated Platforms, hosted by a man that started his profession back in 1995. He worked his way up, eventually, eventually became um, one of the founders and CEOs um, of a software company himself, and he even managed to hold a position as a vice president for a multinational parallel corporation. Later, Nick Drobowski played a key role in an innovation that I think a lot of people are um, still remembering, because um, it's back in 2006 where he took part in the developing and launching the Parallels desktop for Mac which was the world's first software that allowed Mac OS X users um, using Mac applications and Windows applications at the same time. And most recently, Nick joined SIT Rolos as CEO. Um, yeah, and he is going to take over the stage with his panel. Nick, please come to stage. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Hello. Nick Drobowski for you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome, and uh, thank you. I'm happy to uh, be here with you. And before uh, we start with the panel, uh, I would like to introduce the, uh, the theme uh, of, uh, of the panel. Uh, and uh, in reality, so if we look at uh, how science uh, evolved, uh, initially it was purely experimental. Uh, then we began getting some laws of physics, like chemistry, etc. And then with the introduction of computers, uh, we realized that we not only can just uh, experiment, but we can model actually what happens uh, with the experimentation and uh, we got uh, the uh, complex uh, equation unfortunately the only problem is that unfortunately it takes uh, a lot of time to uh, uh, to actually and a lot of resources to do the real computation and uh, modeling of a real experiment uh, and this is uh, just because the systems, uh, the real systems are too complex, as all the previous speakers uh, showed us, uh, that it takes a lot of resources. Uh, and uh, with the introduction of uh, artificial intelligence and precisely neural networks, uh, effectively what we can do, we can uh, have a set from uh, known uh, results from real experimentation or from uh, direct calculations, that we can train the network, that this was the input, this was the output, and with the set, we can train the network, and with a smaller subset, we can verify how well the network predicts what will be in this and these uh, realities. And uh, in this case, once we have such trained network, uh, like, for example, Ducho explained us uh, uh, the alpha fault, right, which went from, like, 20 to 30 to 60 percent, and now they are at 90 percent uh, uh, precise. Uh, so with uh, such trained neural network, we can then uh, model what will happen uh, with the experiments uh, in, uh, in new, uh, with new uh, things. And uh, this comes to uh, every uh, area of science, uh, such approach. Uh, the only problem is that there are no standards, there are uh, no uh, actually uh, good tools uh, for that. And so every scientist, like in physics, in biology, in chemistry, every scientist need to become a software developer uh, in reality. And uh, that means programming on Python, on Shell, etc. That all leads to the problem that results are hard to reproduce and the research cycle is uh, very long. So, and, and as we see, 
uh, there comes uh, a need for uh, for the solution for that. So effectively, some uh, some platform that can uh, solve that programming problem and uh, get it away from scientists. Let them focus on their area of expertise, on physics, biology, chemistry. Uh, and that will all lead to uh, reproducible experiments and uh, accelerated research cycle. Uh, and such platforms will, of course, uh, have uh, artificial intelligence uh, helpers uh, and uh, guides uh, to help scientists. Uh, they will uh, allow for much better collaboration uh, between different groups. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, they should be uh, adapt easily adoptable to science domains uh, because the calculations ba basically they happen in uh, any uh, science domains, but each science is slightly, uh, slightly of course different. Uh, and uh, as we know, there are lots of various hardware resources uh, available uh, up in the cloud. Somewhere here we have computers in uh, Jacobs University cluster. Uh, there are lots of supercomputers available in various uh, countries and from also different universities. So basically the, the same, uh, the same computational work can be run on different uh, servers and such platforms should be uh, should be able to uh, to run those. And so with that, uh, I would like to get to invite uh, Ducho and uh, Konstantin, uh, who are here. Uh, and can we switch? Yeah, so uh, Ankur and uh, Said, uh, welcome. Da, yeah, please take your seats. And I, I will quickly uh, introduce, so uh, you already know, so Konstantin Novoselov is the uh, Nobel Prize winner in physics, inventor of graphene, and uh, he is the uh, head of uh, Institute for Functional Materials and uh, National uh, University of Singapore. Uh, Ducho uh, is our vaccinology expert, and uh, he is the data, data science strategic director at Toscana Life Sciences, as well as uh, director of uh, R3 program, uh, RNA Readiness and Response and Welcome League. And previously, he was the former executive at Navartis at GSK. Uh, and Mohamed, uh, who uh, joined us uh, from uh, Manchester, he is a lecturer and researcher in computational physics uh, there at the University of Manchester, and previously he was uh, at the University of Tokyo. Uh, and Ankur, uh, welcome as well, uh, he is the uh, graduate of uh, Jacobs University of Bremen, uh, so that is uh, uh, very good. And welcome to, back to your alma mater, despite <laughs> that you are remotely. And uh, he is a product leader at Meta, uh, which is uh, ex-Facebook. Uh, and uh, he is the former founder and CEO uh, of uh, Workplace uh, Analytics Platform uh, Status Today. And also he was an expert to uh, the UK Parliament on uh, applications in artificial intelligence. And also he was uh, listed as, uh, with Forbes as 30 under 40 in 2017. And, and so with that, uh, I would like to move uh, to a question. Uh, so uh, Konstantin, uh, first to you. How, how such uh, integrated platforms uh, can help research uh, in your area? Oh. First of all, you are absolutely right that there, are, uh, there is a lot of information which we uh, gathered these days in, uh, through experiments, uh, lots, uh, lots in physics, probably much more in, uh, in biology because you can, you, 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 you can, so with all the, all the genomics you get a huge amount of data which needs to be analyzed somehow. And, uh, 
as human beings, we are quite, quite good solving uh, low dimensional problems. So we, uh, we, uh, we, we can pick up certain, certain symmetries in the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the data and extract certain basic laws, and that was the success of our science for, uh, f for centuries. However, in many cases, uh, I would say biology is probably the, the, the key, it's like drug discovery and so on, but uh, in, in chemistry, in physics, uh, we're getting there as well. Uh, with the large amount of data, the, uh, the relations be between those data points become more and more complex and you probably want to, to dig in, into more, more and more details. And AI definitely, definitely helps uh, uh, enormously and, uh, and we've seen really huge, um, huge advances which were, which were made in science using, uh, using uh, uh, machine learning and, and, and artificial intelligence. And you are absolutely right. So, so we need certain unified, so, and the power of, of, those, uh, of this approach is in data. So the more data you, you get together, so the more, the more, uh, the better prediction or you can get. So we need, uh, we need a platform which would allow us to unify data from, from different researchers, and that's extremely complex, complex tasks. Even in, um, even in physics, I'm, I'm sure in biology, it's even more, it's, it's even more difficult, and allow those uh, to clean this data somehow and to, 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 to be used in a unified way or, uh, in, in, in uh, AI. And without a, pl a, a platform, I, I don't think it's, uh, it's doable. So we basically waste a lot of computational resources in small silos in each, in each institute, in each, in each lab. And the, the progress could be exponential if, if, if all those data are, uh, uh, are brought, brought together in, uh, in some intelligent way. And uh, so, of course, this, this platform, so we're talking that it's a, it's a bit mechanical, but in fact, so a lot of intelligence and a lot of research work has to be uh, to, to, to go there as well to, to really uh, unleash the power of the, of, uh, of the big data. Thank you. Uh, uh, and Ducho, you actually, uh, out, actually outlined. We, we, we got camera. Okay. <laughs> Our mics are so I completely I will forgot. Drop this. All right. Yeah, I think it works. Uh, so, Ducho, you uh, outlined in your work that you process a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, documents, etc., and train the models and uh, subtract information from that. And uh, how in, uh, in, in your area can such platform be helpful? Uh, I, I think a platform approach like the one you're proposing is the most fundamental step that we should take as a community now to accelerate and, as Kostya was saying, to get rid of the enormous amount of time that we spend computationally or human time in cleaning up and putting data in the right formats together before they are analyzable. Um, I think this can happen at, at three levels. One that is domain specific, and this is, um, I don't honestly, I don't know myself that um, an, a data integration and annotation approach with metadata uh, dictionaries that uh, provide the um, information that is required to then make the analysis meaningful. I don't know that this can happen across domains. So what I'm thinking is that you probably want to develop um, a data acquisition, annotation, ontologies, and an integration strategy per domain, one for life sciences, one for probably physical and chemical sciences, one for social sciences, one for uh, economical dynamics, etc. Uh, and then there are two other levels. Um, one is the process. So 
and this is the same across basically every domain, what we always do is we sometimes we generate or collect data that are generated by others. We clean them up and integrate different data sources. So, so we have data acquisition, we have data engineering, then we do some data science, and then we do some um, software engineering, and then when we are particularly successful, we end up developing even graphical user interfaces for the end user outside of the scientific community. This is the same across every dimension, and the way it's structured today, it does not allow for feedback loops in the process, because the data engineer can only talk to the data scientist, basically, and the data scientist has to hand it over to the software developer. And uh, I call myself as a data scientist, but the software I develop is the worst quality software ever, because I'm not a software engineer, that's not my job. I don't know how to develop good software. I know how to analyze data. It's, it's a different set of skills. So then basically the software engineer takes it from scratch and redevelops everything, just basically saving the idea that I had in my algorithm, but it's not even encoding the algorithm in the same way I encoded it. And so there's a lot of waste there. If we can uh, plat platform the process reusing elements of software engineering, which are standard, that, that's a great advantage and would allow feedback to be provided by the users independently of the stage of the process. And, and, and the third thing that we have touched upon a number of times already in this great conference is at the method level, there are a number of characteristics of the social systems that uh, are studied, like Facebook or the, um, any social interacting system or economic systems or bio biological systems, which are absolutely mappable one to one. And so the same algorithmic approaches can be reused across. And this is another way to leverage the platform, I believe. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, Said, uh, you also uh, g gave a speech uh, recently here. And uh, how can it uh, be applied to uh, to your area? Uh, so we we have uh, a lot of we we talk a lot about standardization and uh, uh, and uh, um, like reusage of the algorithms and sharing between people. So how how can it be uh, applied uh, to your area? Um, yeah, thank you. So uh, when it comes to physics, uh, usually we are dealing with systems that uh, are either uh, classifiable as periodic systems or non-periodic systems. So usually for periodic systems, we have a good understanding of basics of the system. So we can, for example, solve uh, uh, quantum mechanical equations and, and find some information about how electrons behave in a, in a, at, the, at the surface or at the interface of a transistor. Uh, but the problem is, in reality, we know that most of the physical system we are dealing with are not that ideal. So uh, usually we need to, to make some approximations. And uh, here the bottleneck of calculations appear because as you try to do calculations uh, quantum mechanically, you realize that the calculations become more and more demanding. So uh, what we always you know, look for is uh, to find some kind of acceleration loops that can uh, make a bridge between quantum mechanics and between experimental data that we receive. Uh, so machine learning is, is a very ideal, uh, let's say, tool that gives us this ability because we have access to a lot of uh, information, let's say, from our crystallographic uh, databases we also have a wealth of information from uh, experimental measurements. And we also know a lot about the basics of, uh, you know, these physical system when it comes to our theoretical models. So um, we are now uh, trying to see what would be the best approach to connect machine learning to our uh, physical models, because 
there are some issues that probably you will not see them in other areas of uh, science. Uh, the problem with defining proper, uh, uh, proper indicators is, is one major problem that somehow uh, uh, is being studied heavily recently. And if we can somehow tackle this problem, I believe machine learning and neural networks and artificial intelligence uh, in general would be an ultimate solution to uh, make uh, some predictions that with this level of theory that we have are impossible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Ankur, uh, also a similar question to you. Uh, so how, how is it, uh, how, how can it be applied in the like you, you did the uh, wor workplace uh, analytics. Uh, now you are at uh, Facebook uh, Meta with uh, with uh, uh, product uh, leading. So how can it be applied to into more like business and industrial areas? Thanks, Nick. Um, it's it's quite fascinating the whole conversation because. When we think about artificial intelligence, uh, I think uh, Kostya was very good at kind of splitting that out into various um, elements. But machine learning platforms can roughly, in their applications, be split in three core, uh, I'd say, segments. Um, when we think about artificial intelligence, it's basically a foundational technology. And it is changing the way other technologies behave. So artificial intelligence by itself is no longer a technology that uh, is, is going all the way to the end user. So we have use cases at foundational level, which enable other domains, other technologies, entire industries. And then we've got uh, domain level artificial intelligence, which could be in physics, workplace, uh, it could be in chemistry, it could be in life sciences. And then finally, we have uh, artificial intelligence working to solve very specific problems. So these could be problems of drug discovery, it could be problems of social connectivity, it could be problem of bullying and harm online. So it's, it's quite, quite complex, but what I have at least learned in, in my experience over the years is that the artificial intelligence is the first time that we've come, that we can use large amounts of data to solve massive problems in society today. So in the workplace, this would be the problem of inequality that some, uh, some employees, some people at the workplace are quiet and some are loud. How do you give them equal voice? When it comes to, to performance, when it comes to career, how do we help people find the right future? But then outside the workplace, when I look at uh, social uh, elements, how do we protect people online? How, how do we bring uh, knowledge from AI to discover new ways of communication and collaboration uh, and then take some of that knowledge and reapply that at the foundational level to say, you know, foundationally speaking, if you can enable foundation technology, then other products, other companies, other industries can adopt that. We're noticing that in artificial intelligence where a lot of technology use cases are now being adopted in other domains uh, like, like real estate, like pure science research, um, like, like drug discovery is a great example where uh, there was a lot of machine learning used in the discovery of the vaccines uh, that are now in production, um, which just goes on to say, I mean, maybe I'll be even more extreme to say artificial intelligence is not a thing anymore. It is how every new technology will operate. It, like, it's not a choice to do it or to not do it. We just have to make sure we do it well. Um, that's at least how I feel the, the industry is evolving. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we are getting some uh, questions from uh, from online, uh, and uh, I would be happy to get uh, questions in the uh, audience uh, as well. Uh, but uh, let me start with one. So, uh, one question is: How would you uh, incentive uh, private industry to share their data? Uh, because, as we know. Lots of, uh, especially pharmaceutical companies, uh, for example, they want to keep the data and don't want to share with anybody, but uh, having access to this data actually enables uh, the research to like many people. So how, how, how can we uh, improve this, Ducha? Can you? Data sharing um, 
in pharmaceuticals. Uh, <laughs> to, um, I think concretely, there are two answers to the question. One is, what have we tried and experienced so far? There are a few consortia which were actually created by pharmaceutical industries exactly for this objective, to facilitate this, with a lot of good intentions and some tangible results that were confined to what we call the pre-competitive space. When, some when sharing some data is going to be of general good and it's not going to harm my uh, commercial advantage, why not sharing it? And this is happening through uh, Transcelerate is one of such consortia. And there are companies like GSK, for example, that even decided to make every clinical data generated uh, so far publicly available upon request. You just have to send an email to a standard address and there's an independent panel that evaluates your request. If it's fair, you will get the data. Um, but this is just data sharing and, and the direct application is very limited to specific questions that you ask. At a more systemic level, I think it's a different strategy that should be taken and it's not about sharing the data that have been generated. It's about agreeing on a standardized methodology to generate the knowledge, not necessarily the data, that is used in the research, development, and manufacturing process. What happened in semiconductors in the 80s with the VLSI revolution, Mead and Conway, when they standardized the key elements of the semiconductor-based manufacturing process, such that you didn't need to be in IBM or Hewlett Packard anymore if you wanted to design a semiconductor, because you didn't need to know quantum mechanics and how to actually implement in a way for the, your specific design. Standard process elements were identified, so product design became an independent process, and then you had TSMC and the other giant manufacturers that don't have their own products, but they just translated the knowledge that is generated in research into a product because the knowledge goes through a standardized um, manufacturer translator. This is what I think we have to do also in pharmaceutical research and this will explode the access to novel medicines if we manage to disentangle the, the protection on the um, intellectual property for the manufacturing processes from the research and development space up front. Yeah, and uh, maybe in terms of data, it can be that you don't need access to effectively the, uh, the sources of the data, right? The initial data, but some aggregated statistics or like uh, that depends results. On, on, that depends on what you need to do. Sometimes yeah. you actually need access to the to the raw data because the information is there, is not in the aggregated statistics. Uh, but sometimes also... But what, what can be helpful with, uh, with such platform approach is that uh, you have an algorithm and that algorithm by the means of platform uh, gets access and processes that data and gives, oh, yeah. you, gives you the results. So by all means. effectively you don't get access to, to the data uh, yourself but your algorithm processes it and gives you the aggregated results that you need. Uh, because basically you, you don't need those like terabytes of data which, which effectively you will not go through them uh, yourself. Yeah, but uh, I think we also, we just cannot pretend that, uh, that it's not a problem and that it will be an issue and, and it always be, be an issue. And those companies, they always try to keep their cars close to their chest, say when, uh, a certain Korean company would publish uh, a report that they start working on a new material for new transistors. The right way to read it is that we've been working on it for the last 10 years, failed, <laughs> failed miserably, and now we just, we just uh, need to, to cut out losses, right? And, uh, but, but the 
the beauty of, 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 of AI is that the, the, the failed data point is as, as valuable as the, uh, as, uh, as, the, as the successful one. So if you know wh where not to go, you could say it would be, it would be also, uh, also useful. So uh, the results of the, the negative results of the clinical trials are, uh, are equally important. So at least we could probably encourage uh, to, 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 to put negative results. So, okay, keep your, uh, at the start, keep your success close to your chest, but, uh, but at least share the, 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 all the failures and it would strengthen the platform and, and the data as well. Exactly, exactly. And I, I was actually going to add a quick comment to that. This is so important. I think people always think of data as things that go well and things that have been discovered. But m the most value in data comes from things that don't go well or attempts or, or areas of attempts. If we look at the airline industry and planes, imagine if after every incident on a plane, a plane crash, the, the airline company did not share the data because they said it's proprietary, we don't want to reveal what happened, then the industry wouldn't be as evolved as it is today. So every time there's an incident, the investigation happens, the information is shared with the broader ecosystem, and everyone is safer, including the airline, the plane manufacturer, be it Boeing, Airbus, whoever. And I think uh, that also happens in, in, in uh, medical science with doctors, but it doesn't happen in research because it's considered more proprietary. So I, I absolutely agree. If not success, the failures, I think, are more valuable than successes. Thank you. And uh, Said, this is a sensitive topic, Said. And uh, how, how, how does it uh, happen? You, you, you also work with industry, as I know, right? Yeah, partly, yes. So how does it happen in your area? Uh, do they do, do they keep the data or do they share the data of those industrial researchers? Uh, so uh, we do have access uh, openly to uh, some data, but it's it's also a reality that part of uh, you know data that we want to get access to uh, is not freely available, and we have to somehow either. Uh, pay for it or uh, somehow acquire it through some mutual agreements. Uh, but uh, the reality is that if you want to have uh, a very successful uh, approach to data science, having access to a large amount of data is essential. And um, at the same time, I think uh, this is something that will eventually happen because we see that, for example, when it comes to science, now we have uh, projects like materials project that tries to somehow uh, uh, open access the, to a wealth of information about the crystal, uh, crystal, uh, crystalline systems. And uh, also there are some other attempts to, you know, uh, uh, make uh, information about the uh, in, in surface or interstitial uh, properties of the systems uh, available to everyone. So I know that there are many groups that um, are trying to make their uh, databases uh, available, but at the same time, uh, the problem is that part of these uh, uh, attempts are uh, somehow, uh, let's say, yeah, uh, hindered by the fact that we still need uh, some, uh, some permissions, either from, uh, you know, big data companies, or sometimes, you know, these are just informations that are not publishable. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think these are some bottlenecks in our uh, uh, in our uh, journey to having a more successful uh, AI approach to data sciences. Uh, but what I want to also add here is that uh, I believe there should be some uh, some interaction between different disciplines of science when it comes to um, data evaluation. Uh, for example, uh, let's say we are not trying just to use the uh, algorithms developed by computer scientists. And uh, these are things that are suitable for our current technology, 
But I think for, uh, for, for what we want to do in future, probably we need to take something, for example, from physics and add it to these algorithms. For example, when it comes to neural networks, uh, I know that people are trying now to use uh, some very physical concepts like quantum entanglement and add it to, uh, for example, the nodes that we have in our neural network. And somehow they want to make these uh, uh, neural network nodes quantum entangled so that you can perform uh, uh, many, uh, many evaluations simultaneously. So these are things that I think can be uh, done by computer scientists better than physicists. But in order to have a proper interaction between different disciplines, I think there should be a, a healthy flow of information between different disciplines of science together in order to make AI even more powerful than what it is today. Thank you. And we have a question uh, here from the audience. Yeah, probably Mohammed partially answered my question, but <laughs> I still want to raise it. Uh, I believe that in science we have the same trend of competition and uh, scientists, they are also not willing to share their data, algorithms that, that they develop, or some workflows that they build, um, just because they want to get all insights, they, go, they want to publish all potential papers, so uh, no one steal <laughs> their ideas. Um, how can we uh, approach this trend? How can we reverse it so uh, science becomes more open? Well, uh, yeah, it's a it's a good question, and it's it's not it's not clear uh, um, what the was the best was the best mechanism for it. Of course, by law, most of us uh, we we supposed to to. To, to share those data, and so we are publicly f uh, funded. So, uh, so the, the data don't belong to me. So, the, the, even not to the university. It's uh, it's public. So, if, if I move from one university to 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 another, even my lab book supposed to to stay on the on the desk. I usually keep, uh, carry them with me, but. Uh, but in principle, it's not it's not mine. So, um, but of course, people need to be and 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 of course in in particle physics, in cosmology, uh, people are much more uh, are much more uh, uh, willing to, to share much easily simply because the amount of data they collect we. We, we won't be able to analyze within our lifetime, even if all the poor PhD students are forced to work 24-7 uh, without, without lunch breaks. So, um, so in principle, this, this approach needs to, be, needs to be there. And, uh, and uh, of course, all of us, we would die for a, for a good paper, not for, not for, uh, for, uh, for just for the data which are which are there, so we so our uh, our product is not data. Our product is understanding of those of those data, right? So, and if 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 anyone of got a new algorithm which would uh, which would push this understanding forward, that's what it. Uh, I would I would definitely would be willing to to collaborate. How to put it into the open and at the same time. Keep the uh, keep the acknowledgement of people who produce those. It's a difficult question, but um, we also work uh, with the journal. So uh, how can we acknowledge the data production? So it's actually uh, it's a, it's a good question to the publishers as well because maybe uh, so in the in the modern world where AI is uh, is developing so there should be a different structure for the publication where we acknowledge the authorships the uh, but also the data pro the data production and 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 the the platform so people who can contributed this and I'm sure that within five years the, the way how we publish and produce the data will be very different. 
And uh, we have only four minutes left. I, I have a good question that actually came to Konstantin, but I believe uh, that uh, each of our speakers will be great to answer. So uh, one minute to each of you. How AI and computation can push the limits in uh, some science domains uh, in your experience? So uh, what I really like, of course, the, all the all the prediction and pre uh, producing uh, materials with the predicted properties and and so on. That's that's all cool. Uh, my excitement is around uh, how to do we uh, can we produce uh, how can we learn science from the data. So something which is beyond our understanding. Like uh, as physicists, we are extremely good at solving these spherical and cuboid horses, right? So the moment the horse becomes a little bit elliptical, that's it. So we are, we, we fail, but probably there is, a, there is more, there is more science in it. And, and how, how, and, and AI is actually quite good in extracting those few parameters, which are the key parameters from the millions measurements you can make on the horse from the size, from the size of their, of their legs to the, to the length of the tail. So which, which one of the parameters are the dominant and what are the relations? So that's already real science and real, uh, real physics. And uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's, I think, is the future of, of, of AI in my area. Yeah. Uh, exactly on the same line. Uh, I, I was touching before on the difference between when you um, analyze a complex system, the traditional approach of uh, inductive experimental science that we use, have been using for the last five centuries do not work because the complex system cannot be reduced in smaller, simple subsystems that you can solve one by one. You need to understand the entirety of, of the system. Now, what we've been trying to do in the first 30 years of complexity has been to look at the macroscopic statistical features of the system because that, that's somehow easy to look at and try to infer something that explains what's inside because it matches the macroscopic characteristics. What we can do with AI is completely different, is actually trying to learn what happens inside the complex system through uh, tools like deep neural networks, for example. And what we will see at first is that the network works, that the task that we're giving to the network is fulfilled with good accuracy. But that's basically irrelevant. What's relevant is that we, we have a good chance that if the network succeeds at its task, it's learning something real that happens inside the dynamics of the system. That's the important part. And then it's reverse engineering of the inner nodes of the network that gives us the new science. Thank you. Said? Yeah, I think uh, we are at the words of a cognitive evolution in, uh, in science, and it's because there are two uh, emerging fields. One is quantum computation and another is AI. They are just made for each other and they are lucky to be happening at the very same uh, you know, uh, point of time. And it's uh, really amazing to see that uh, at some point we should be able uh, to use the power of AI to somehow create uh, algorithms uh, suitable for quantum computation. So when we also use the power of quantum computation to create more, let's say, sophisticated AI algorithms, I think it would be quite fascinating to see how they can work together in order to create new ways for manipulating data and also creating new areas for science. So I believe it, it's, it's a very fascinating uh, time uh, for scientists because at some point i think probably in the next few years we will see that quantum computers become more tangible facts they are not just like things that you hear about them in news but they become accessible to scientists as well so if we can control ai and apply them to quantum computation i think we should be able to realize things that are or unimaginable at the current stage Thank you very much. And Ankur? I think um, 
you know, the, we, we've had years and well, centuries of precedent in the scientific method. AI for the first time has the potential to change the scientific method of discovery and the laws that we've all agreed on how scientific method works because AI doesn't go incrementally, it goes exponentially. More and more there's research in AI around low data models. These are AI algorithms that do not need a lot of data to produce very high levels of intelligence. But what that means is AI will make mistakes, AI will be imperfect, but it will still operate at scale. So for me, when we look at our professional and personal lives, AI has the ability to change socially how we interact with each other and give each other the voice. If we are on Facebook, Instagram, or if we are uh, meeting each other one-to-one, -one, it has the ability to create that life companion that can protect us, give us the voice when, when we feel we don't have the voice in terms of understanding what we are trying to do and protecting us from, from harm uh, online and offline, which we are starting to see around the world. So for me, AI actually will make us more human, uh, even though it's coming from computers, which is for me the, the, the greatest, uh, greatest uh, gift it could give to us. Thank you very much. So uh, it, it, as we see, AI is uh, like, let's say, our future, right? The future of our science. And uh, let's, uh, it's great to see that uh, uh, um, everybody uh, understands this, at least our speakers, and they use it intensively. And so uh, let's see what, uh, what will happen next. Thank you very much Thank for, you. for sharing your experience. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, dear panel. Happy to have you here. Thank you very much.